we uh, bring up the screen there, and I'll jump right into this. I'm assuming it's coming up in, in a second. And while you're, while you're bringing that up, um, let, me, let me say that what, what I want to do first is talk about the landmark Baptist position. And, uh, and, and even preface that by, by saying this. When I talk about the landmark Baptist, I'm talking about my brothers and sisters in Christ. There are a couple of different theories of Baptist beginnings. And one of them is the landmark position, which says that the Baptist began with Jesus and John and the Jordan River. Get three J's in there. And, and traces successively a perpetual chain all the way to the present day. And another view is what we call the Anabaptist spiritual kinship view which simply says that th there's no visible church, local church connection that you can trace all the way back, but we Baptists today do have a spiritual kinship with many groups all the way back through uh, to the time of Christ. And that, I, I would say nothing wrong with that. Al although I don't think that we Baptists are the only ones who might be able to claim that. You wouldn't have to be a Baptist to claim that there were... Uh, identifiable Christians all the way back. They were, because when you speak, even when we speak of the Baptist distinctives, in the back of our minds, don't we, don't we ask ourselves, are there some other churches who practice baptism by immersion only, of believers only, and other churches who practice congregational polity, other churches who have two offices elected? So I, I think we as Baptists today have to look at the package of the distinctives and say, well, we probably today are the only uh, denomination that holds to all of the package collectively. G tracing back through history, you will find groups who, who held to certain of them. The, other, the view that I hold on the beginnings of Baptist is the, the uh, descent of the Baptist from the English separatist Puritan movement. The English separatists and the, and the Puritans. The Puritans and the separatists believed the same thing except one separated from the Church of England and the other didn't. And we came out of that group as a visible uh, denomination that was actually called Baptist for the first time in 1644. The earliest churches, Baptist churches in England, were the first one was uh, uh, 1611, General Baptist, and the first particular Baptist was 1638. And most of us today trace our roots back through the particular Baptist. So I'm going to be talking about both of those. But as far as the, uh, the uh, landmark Baptists are, concer are, are concerned, uh, you see the names on the screen, uh, I hope you can... The, my font was large enough to uh, make it legible. The two men who gave Landmark Baptist their name was James M. Pendleton and his title, An Old Landmark Reset, and James R. Graves, who wrote, Old Landmarkism, What Is It? Pendleton was not as dogmatic with the points of landmarkism as Graves. Graves actually defined the movement. And he, there are four or five tenets of the landmark Baptist position. Number one is the only churches in the Bible are local churches. There's no such thing as a universal church. Now Pendleton actually didn't agree with that. Graves held that alone as far as the leaders, the founders were concerned. Pendleton said, no, you, could, you go to passages like uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 25, uh, where it says um, in Ephesians 5, 25, we read, 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, which Baptist church is that? You know, which, which, which denomination is that? None of them, because there is that concept in Scripture of the universal, the one body of Christ. And if that is not what that verse is talking about, I want someone to show me that church so I can go and join it just as quickly as I can because I want to be in the church for which Christ died. And he's talking about his body, that he has one body, one Lord, one faith, one body, one baptism, and so forth. You know, you know the verse. And so, you know, the word church, ecclesia, is found about 100 and almost 114 times in the scripture and most of those times, most of those times, well over 85 of those times, uh, he, the Bible is talking about local church. The emphasis in the New Testament is local church. The church is a New Testament entity. It was founded on the day of Pentecost. The local church is God's emphasis today. We need to be very, very careful and, and reverent towards the local church, the Bible-believing, Bible-preaching local church. But there are those few passages, like Ephesians 5.25, that must be talking about something besides a local church. So there is in the scripture the local church and what we call the universal church. I think Schofield's notes call it the, the mystical church. I usually call it the universal church, which unfortunately back in the early centuries uh, was translated Catholic. Catholic means universal. And eventually, as the centuries went on, they capitalized the C and made it a, a, a state church, beginning with Constantine. And soon after that, they put Roman in front of it, Roman Catholic Church. And there was no Roman Catholic Church until the early 7th century. Don't let the Roman Catholics intimidate you by saying, come home, because we were first. Well, they were first as far as organization was concerned, but the Roman Catholic Church wasn't first because for the first five centuries, almost six centuries, the church universal and the church local was simply, as far as earthly visible churches are concerned and visible Christians are concerned, simply the primitive church. I like to call it primitive church. I like to look at the seven churches of Revelation as the primitive churches. The churches who saw the formation of the canon of Scripture. The churches who looked at the various books that were being claimed by sometimes heretical teachers as being inspired. Those primitive Christians who, who put to the test of canonicity all of those books and decided under the direction of the Holy Spirit which books are worth dying for. They were the primitive Christians. The Roman Catholic Church didn't give us the Bible. The Bible precedes the Roman Catholic Church by far. Don't be intimidated. The Roman Catholic Church took almost 600 years to develop. And when it finally came to anything that we could... Uh, anything that, that, that is any way identifiable with today's Roman Catholic Church would be with Pope Gregory I, who was Pope from 590 to 604. And so, I didn't mean to say all that. It's, it's, uh, anyway, number two is uh, Jesus built the first local Baptist church, and every true church since that time has been a Baptist church. That's what uh, James R. Graves taught that Jesus built the first local church and every true church since that time has been a Baptist church. Now, when Jesus said, I will build my church uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he's talking about the oneness of his body. Satan has destroyed many a local Baptist church, and, but Satan cannot touch the one body of Christ because God is going to have witnesses, true Christians, in every era. There's, he's never left himself without a witness. And so there are always Christians. But that church that the gates of hell cannot destroy is Christ's promise that the, his resurrection, the, the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ, will protect his, his church. And he will build his church. And he's still building his church. He hasn't finished 
until we see him in the eastern sky saying, come home. And then we're really coming home because we're coming to the oneness of his body, all believers. Number three, Graves said the term kingdom in the Bible refers collectively to all the Baptist churches. And that's, that's the way he took the word kingdom. So if you followed that, every time you found the word kingdom, you'd have to just put the word Baptist churches in there. And that would end up sounding a little unnatural. Number four, since the only true church is a Baptist church, no other church qualifies to function in any way as a church. And oftentimes they'll tell you that, that unless you're a Baptist, you're not even qualified to give the gospel to a lost sinner because Christ gave the keys to the Baptist church. And you don't have the keys and you, you're not qualified, therefore, to lead anyone to Christ. And, and one landmarker I was reading not too long ago said the Bible itself was written by Baptists to Baptists in order to make Baptists, more Baptists. And, and I couldn't help but chuckle. But again, I'm telling you that not all churches that have landmark on the sign out front are landmark in this sense. And, and many landmark Baptist churches in this sense do not have landmark in their name. And not all landmark churches are as rigorous about it as Graves was. So they have, they have different degrees of landmark Baptist. And I'm willing to I'm willing to work with any separated Bible-believing Baptist. That doesn't offend me. But as a historian, I have to be honest with what I find in history and what I find in Scripture. So, so I'm not trying to pick a fight with anyone. I don't want to debate anyone. Might, you know, I've had to do that a few times, debate, but, but I've, not, I've not gotten angry with anyone about it. And, and number five, Jesus promised an unbroken historical succession of Baptist churches in the world until he returns for his Baptist bride. So the Baptist bride, Christ's bride, according to landmarkism, is uh, collectively all the Baptist churches. My brother, my sister, you can be anywhere in the world with no Baptist church anywhere around, with no mother church to whom to look, and take your Bible under the direction of the Holy Spirit and you can, you can establish a Baptist church, a Bible church, a Bible-believing Baptist church anywhere, anytime, and it is just as legitimate as one who claims to have a mother who has a mother who has a mother and we end up being you know, one of the daughters. That is scriptural. We do, let, let Rome use successionism back to Peter. We do not need a visible succession back to John the Baptist. It's just, why? Why do you need that? It seems so insecure to think that you need something besides the Bible. This, this book is what we need. That's all we need. So in his pamphlet, uh, his pamphlet called The Trail of Blood, J.M. Carroll I, I obviously anachronistically equates Anabaptists with the Baptists. Now he has... Uh, Carol was a, was a God, he was a soul winner. He was a good man. I, I could fellowship with this man any old day, but as far as his history is concerned, I have to refute it because I know better. But he equates Anabaptists with Baptists, and he tries to do this by quoting a, a Roman Catholic cardinal back in the 16th century, uh, claiming, and this is the quote that you hear, this is the one that Carol has in Trail of Blood, were it not, I'm quoting from Trail of Blood here, were it not that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with a knife during the past 1,200 years, they would swarm in number greater than all the reformers. Now, before I take you to that one, let, let me just say briefly, he, he didn't give... Now, his source says works of Cardinal Hostius, but he didn't give a page number. He didn't give a volume number. I finally found it. Now, it's written in Latin, and I'm glad I took Latin, and I'm glad I've been able to use it in teaching church history. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to find this, because if this man says that, I, you know, I, I want to find it. Well, I found the page, and, and I found where he's obviously using the part of the paragraph, a part of the page, and the word Baptist isn't there. He uses a word that could be translated Anabaptist, 
probably was talking about the Donatist back beginning in the third century, who, by the way, were godly people and good people. I love the Donatist, in spite of the fact that they baptized babies. They were not Baptist. They baptized babies. And they believed in baptismal regeneration of babies. And they were, my, the, the Catholic Church, not Roman Catholic, but the Catholic Church in, in their day uh, persecuted them greatly. And they slaughtered many of them. And, and they were good people. But ladies and gentlemen, Cardinal Hosius didn't know what a Baptist was. He never used the word. And the word he uses certainly isn't Baptist. And the, another source, the major source, that Landmark Baptist, you, you find this in John uh, T. Christian's uh, Baptist history book, the major quote that they use, in fact, this is the one I'm, I'm about to show you, this is the one that they say, the most important defense of landmark perpetuity, successionism, is this quote from Ippage and DeMount, two Dutch historians in the 19th century who wrote a four-volume history of the Dutch Reformed Church in Dutch. And this is what they quote from Ippage and DeMount. The Baptist were formerly called Anabaptist and may be considered as the only Christian society which has stood since the days of the apostles. However, I'll just leave that up there a moment while I say this. My, my responsibility as a Christian historian is to find that quote. John T. Christian didn't tell us who translated it for him. He didn't tell us what volume it was in. He didn't tell us what page it was on. So I had to go through four volumes, Latin, I mean uh, Dutch, and find those quotes. Well, I'm not very good at translating Dutch. So I found a, a, a teacher of Dutch. He lives in Amsterdam. He has, he has no idea what landmarkism is. He was, he was very objective. I, talk, I said, all I want you to do is translate it for me. And, and, and give it your best shot. I didn't tell him why. So he, here's an objective translator. And then he took me to the source. He said, here's, here's where they're quoting right here. And they never used the word Baptist. They, they used two words. They used Anabaptist and they used Mennonite. They never used Baptist, ever. Even though there were some prominent Baptists in Holland at that time when Ippage and DeMount were writing. And the landmark sources never tell us what is on the screen, where the authors describe the Anabaptist as having a very harmful impact on the outer life of the Protestant community. And then they lament the fact that the Mennonites were being confused with the Anabaptists. The Mennonites went by a different Dutch word, Dupengizen the dippers. And so th what these authors are really saying is, first of all, they don't mention Baptists, but even the Anabaptists are bad, and the Mennonites are really good. And so whether we agree with that or not, they certainly do not teach anything remotely resembling what the landmark Baptists are trying to put into this. What I did find through the translation that we, that we got, was that the Landmark Baptists have taken several pages of Volume 1 and picked up phrases without using ellipsis points, indicating they're omitting stuff, and they have pieced together phrases, sentences, sometimes paragraphs, all into one little creation that you see on the screen. And if that's their best argument, and they claim it is, uh, John T. Christian claims it is, and B.H. Carroll claims it is, that's not a very good thing. Now, there are two strands of Baptist beginnings, two histories, 
One is general Baptist, one is particular. The general Baptists are called general because they believed in an unlimited atonement, general atonement. Christ died for everyone. The particular Baptists are limited atonement, particular redemption, that Christ died only for the elect. Now, I find this. The particular Baptists are getting this very much from the Puritans and the Westminster Confession of Faith. And I want to hasten to say that really most particular Baptists were men who would never go to seed on limited atonement. They believed it, but they were soul winners. Charles Spurgeon was a particular redemptionist, five-point Calvinist. He said that on many an occasion. William Carey, the great Baptist missionary from England to India, was a particular Baptist. The father of modern missions he was, but he was a soul winner. He was a missionary. So the particular Baptist that I have known, at least the the important ones, the ones who were really getting the job done, were those who were balanced. Now, personally, I'm not a particular redemptionist. I, I, I can sit down with any poor, lost, blind sinner and say, Sir or ma'am, Christ died for you. And God loves you. I can say that without any reservation. Now, if you really, if you're, if you're rigid, via pointer, you can't really say that without reservation. You have some reservation. And you're not being honest. But we should be able to tell any sinner, God loves you. Christ died for you. Give your soul to Christ. Give your heart to Christ. A good book that, that I recommend, about, I think the best book, Refuting Landmarkism is a book by James McGoldrick. It's still in print. A little bit expensive, but, but I think worth it if you want to do some real study on this because he proves that Baptists are, are, are not uh, landmarkers and that Baptists really was, were Protestants when they started. In fact, they called themselves Protestants. Let's go to England for the next 10 minutes. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about the Mayflower Pilgrims just a little bit, but I'll not be able to say much about them because I just want to talk about the Pilgrims as, as the circle of their history touches the tangent, the tangent line of the Baptists. And so, but I, I put all of that in a, in a book called The Mayflower Pilgrims. William Bradford wrote the best book on the Mayflower Pilgrims because he was one of them. Uh, and that's a page, a manuscript page from his, uh, of Plymouth Plantation. He, that's the best source that I used the best source anyone could find on the Mayflower Pilgrims. And Bradford did call them pilgrims as he was standing on the shores of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And he said they were strangers and pilgrims as he quoted Hebrews 11 verses 13 and 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Let's go to London. There's Big Ben and there's the Tower Bridge, just a few, 35 miles perhaps, below London is Cambridge. Cambridge University trained the Puritans. 99% of the Puritans were Cambridge men. And the separatists who were university trained were Cambridge men for the most part. So I just wanted to throw that out. And the Puritans, when James I, when Elizabeth died and James I came to the throne and, and he, he, he agreed to meet with the Puritans uh, at the uh, Hampton Court Conference, these were the grievances that the Puritans had with the Church of England. The, the only legal place of worship in the country was the Church of England. These were the grievances which they presented. You know, again, let me, let, let me say this again. Doctrinally, the Puritans and the Separatists were on the same page. In practice, the Separatists came out of the Church of England. The Puritans stayed in. They're called Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England within, without leaving it. They didn't succeed. And they eventually, the Puritans went out of business. And they just, there, there were no Puritans by the end of the 
17th century. In England, uh, 50 years earlier than that, they were gone. In New England, they lasted about 50 years longer. The grievances were making the sign of the cross in baptism, use of elaborate ministerial regalia, too much formalism, uh, no biblical prerequisites for the Lord's Supper. You think about the Reformation, you think about what the Reformation was. Suddenly, uh, Henry VIII declares, we're Protestants now. The, the Church of England is Protestant now. Well, what do you have? What do these ministers have sitting in front of them? They have a bunch of Roman Catholics who are now Protestants. They have not been, uh, most of them have not been saved. And those who believe have not been recipients of believer's baptism. That's why they needed a Puritan movement to purify the Church of England. It took a long time. And even they failed uh, in many respects. The misuse of terms such as priest. There is no office of priest in the New Testament local church. That's an Old Testament word. The priest today is our great high priest. And if, matter, as far as that concerns, we're all priests. We're all priests. But, but not as a church office. The priesthood of every believer is that any believer can can go to heaven and call upon the Lord and commun communicate with the Lord without a mediator coming between. Absolution is forgiveness of sin. That's not, that's not the priest's task. The lack of sufficient scripture in the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer using the Apocrypha. They had ministers who lacked gifts and qualifications. They, they were still confessing to the local priest. They had no biblical church discipline. They had a great ecclesiastical hierarchy, great in the sense of bigness, not great in terms of quality, with archbishops and uh, metropolitans and so forth. Local churches were not allowed to choose their own ministers. I'm glad I'm a Baptist because we believe what the Bible teaches about a local church. Thank God for a local church that believes the Bible, a pastor who preaches the Bible, believes it with all his heart, how grateful we can be for living now where we are today in this country. And, and as a Baptist church, we can, we can call men under the collective leadership of the congregation, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who believe something and will be faithful in teaching it. So at the Hampton Court Conference, James I met, heard all those grievances, and, uh, and, and finally said... Uh, no. The one thing that they had asked for that he said yes about, we want a new translation of the Bible. And he says, yes, you may have that. So that's the one good thing that King James did. He authorized the publication, the translation and publication of the, of the beautiful King James Bible. Now, in England, up in the Midlands, if you go up about 160 miles straight north up from London, you're in the soft fruit country, strawberries and uh, all the, all the uh, berries that we love so much. In that area, the Mayflower Pilgrims lived. That was the home base of the Mayflower Pilgrims. And they, they worshiped for several years in Gainsborough in this old hall. And their pastor was named John Smith. And he was a good man. He was a brilliant Cambridge graduate. And, and he pastored uh, these people. And uh, right in there, in that, in that great hall of the old hall, he preached. The pilgrims actually were traveling from Scrooby, which is across the River Trent and over about 12 miles over. And it was dangerous because these church services were illegal. If they were caught, they could all be imprisoned. The lord of the manor there in Gainsborough allowed them to use the room because he sympathized with the separatists. These men were separatists. And so soon it became unsafe for a hundred, more than a hundred people to travel on Sundays all the way from Scrooby over to Gainsborough. So they soon had to just stay in Scrooby and, and worship in the, in the manor house there under William Brewster. Meanwhile, John Smith stayed here in, the, in Gainsborough, and in 1606, probably late 1606, early 1607, 
he and most of his people crossed the North Sea, went into Amsterdam, escaped the persecution in England. A year later, the Scrooby group did the same thing. Now, here's the way you can see uh, how John Smith spelled his last name. I wanted to get that on the screen for you. So they slipped away in 1607. And while he was there, he worshiped with another group of separatists there in Amsterdam and very soon broke away from them and became an Anabaptist. John Smith became an independent Anabaptist. He probably learned Anabaptism from the Mennonites who were called Anabaptists. He, the church that he had used a building, used a, a building that they rented from the Mennonites. And, and they taught him that the only true baptism is the baptism of a believer, not an infant. Now, motor baptism was not an issue. They didn't immerse. Anabaptists didn't immerse except for a very small group uh, called the Waterlander Mennonites in, in Amsterdam. But John Smith became enamored with the Anabaptists, Mennonites. He applied for membership that he wanted them to just take in his whole group. We will dispense our organization and we'll just merge in with yours. We'll stop our separate identity. They were not so quick to accept him. So he wrote a confession of faith to present to the Mennonites. And even then, they, they waited several years. In fact, Smith died in 1612 before the church was accepted in 1615. But in order for John Smith to become a Mennonite, he had to become an apostate. Because the Mennonites, those particular Mennonites in Holland at that time, I want to qualify that by, by saying this, Mennonites, most Mennonites today do not hold to the heresy that I'm going to tell you right now. They, the Mennonites eventually shook off that heresy, and, but at that time, they were Pelagian. Pelagius was a man who lived back in the 5th century who taught that no one is born a sinner. Every baby is pure as Adam was before he fell, and that's heresy. That is absolute heresy because it denies the imputation of Adam's sin to his offspring. So, when John Smith applied for membership at the, with the Mennonites, Thomas Helweis, you see his name on the screen, broke away from him. Helweis says, that's not what we believe. That's not what you preached in Gainsborough to those separatist believers. Now he's not just an Arminian, he's a Pelagian. So Thomas Helweis, who is an Arminian, which is not a heresy, even though most of us are not Arminians, it's not a heresy, but Hel Helweis broke away, eight or ten with him, broke away from Smith, went back to London in the face of persecution and established the first Baptist church on English soil, 1611, early, or early 1612. So Smith touches Baptist history only by way of causing a group to leave him in order to become true Baptist. So that's the, that's the connection there. These are Scrooby pictures. That's the manor house where Elder Brewster was, uh, was ministering and feeding the horses of the mail carriers, the, Pony Express, as they came through the old Roman road, the old North Road, went right through Scrooby. And the beginning of New England, because I, the Mayflower came in 1620. And that was before the Puritans came in 1630. They were 10 years ahead of the Puritans coming over here. That's all that remains of the old manor house. That's it. Those brick walls, those, those, that interior there heard the prayers the hymn singing, the testifying, the preaching of godly separatist people. They were good people, those Mayflower pilgrims. I love those people. Well, I don't think I have time to tell you how they got over to Holland, but I, uh, we'll, we'll do that uh, 
after we take a little break. I think I'll just start in the next service right where I left off in the Sunday school. Will that be okay? Then we'll get them. We don't want to leave them in England. They're being persecuted. We've got to get them over to where they can be the pilgrims and worship in liberty. One thing about Holland is that they love they loved to receive refugees who were being persecuted in other countries, but they took the idea of freedom too far and they became so worldly that you go to Holland today, you know, you see what I'm talking about. It, it just went too far. You're dismissed for our break time, I guess. <laughs>